wonderful story. The ghost hunter himself, Mr. Richard, just in from the cemetery. Crow, did you bring in anything with you? Well, we went by one of uh, the home of one of your favorite Chicago personalities, Ed. You did? Mm-hmm. Who? H. H. Holmes. You went by Herman Mudgett. Remember him? That was his you real name. It. Herman Mudgett, H. H. Holmes. You were down on Wallace Avenue, were 63rd you? Street. 63rd Street. 63rd Street. I know Wallace. that he's one of your favorite characters, and that's one of the reasons why I decided this year to add uh, the famous story of Murder Castle. I, I patterned my medical career after Dr. H. H. Holmes. That is now, of course, a post office. Right. We better not uh, say which one, or we won't get our mail on the south side. But at one time, it was a pretty gruesome place. How is the ghost hunter? Doing fine, Ed. You uh, seem to uh, have your act together tonight? Oh, hmm? I've got uh, everything, uh, got my show together, and I took it on the road. Uh, so. Boy, this is our annual Halloween visit, and isn't this ironic that the calendar is lined up so well and here we are on actual Halloween morning. Just on a stroke of Halloween oh, here, we're getting absolutely. going, huh? Absolutely. So tell me, tell me, what big plans have you got for a Halloween day? Well, Halloween day is actually a little bit uh, anticlimactic because everybody uh, uh, was after me today because today being Friday and uh, I, I did a Channel 60 program, I did uh, call-in shows from around the country. I made the Associated Press the other day. I don't know if you caught that in yes, the wires. Yes, yes. And that's just brought in an influx of uh, uh, calls from all around the country. And believe me, ghosts have never been more popular. Ghosts are riding a crest of popularity now like you wouldn't believe. Why or what do you think accounts for this? Is it uh, the media? Is it, I don't know, an acceptance, a greater acceptance of the hard to explain? Or is it just our desire to get lost in something new? Well, as you know, Ed, I've been running tours now commercially since 73, and uh, uh, been at this a long time before that. And when I began years ago, I, I sort of found a, uh, uh, a stone wall that I would have to come up against on occasion of people that I would have to convince that my study of local ghost stories and folklore and legend was, was worthwhile. And believe me, there is no resistance anymore. People are just <laughs> coming out of the woodwork to study our ghost. And as you know, we've had uh, film crews into Chicago to do yes. stories about Resurrection Mary and other ghost stories around Chicago. We've had film crews in from Japan, from England, from Hollywood. Chicago's where it's at now when it comes to good ghostly tales. This is uh, probably one of the most popular places because of you and the tours. You just, uh, for the first time ever, completed a summer of ghost tours by boat. The world's first supernatural cruises. Yes. This By the is... way, you you were lacking on those. You were missing on those. I heard. Your fans are all. <clears throat> excuse me. Your fans keep asking, when are we going to get Eddie on one of these? Well, I uh, as soon as it warms up and you're back at it. Very good. I've got I've got a big life jacket and I am ready to come along. But uh, remember last summer when we talked about the Eastland and everything and uh, all those great stories Ooh. along the river and the lake. Some of your favorite pieces of Chicago trivia and history with ah. a ghostly connection. As you have explained to us so many times, for some reason, there is a connection between ghosts and water. And for some reason, ghosts and water get together very often, don't they? Yes, indeed. For the purpose of definition, and we ask you to listen to what, what we say here tonight with um, an open ear and an open mind, and to decide for yourself what you believe and what you don't, but uh, why don't you explain, uh, just for the sake of uh, information, how you got started in all of this, because it's, uh, it's a very interesting story. Well, anybody out in your listening audience with a liberal arts degree can uh, appreciate the situation I found myself in some years ago. I took courses in English literature and geography at DePaul University because I like courses in English literature and geography. Didn't really know quite what I would do with that degree, but I earned a BA and MA uh, from DePaul. And as I've done many times, I'm going to give credit again to my geography professor, Dr. Richard Hauck, still at the DePaul Geographical Department, for the uh, concept of a tour. Because it was Dr. Hauck who asked me to put together a tour of the ghostly geography around Chicago to be sponsored by the university for Halloween weekend of 1973. And it was that tour, meant to be a one-time tour only, that turned away 200 people and showed me, at least, that a lot of the public appreciates a good ghost story, 
shares my interest enough to want to come on out and uh, join me on one of my guided tours around the area. How many spots totally over the years since 1973 have you come upon? I know you don't use them all all the time, but if you... If I had to ask you for a grand total number of interesting places, I mean, if, you, if we said you have an unlimited amount of time, go to every place you know of, how long would that tour take? Uh, that would be quite an extensive tour, Ed. I'll tell you what I do right now. I have a, a day trip of 13 locations, a night trip of 13 locations, and the, the current Halloween run, I have uh, uh, 12 locations, and... and uh, Five of them, I think, are, are new or, or some old ones I've resurrected, mm -hmm. no pun intended, for uh, this trip. Uh, uh, uh. And, uh, you know, I'm always adding and changing and finding new things, and uh, I'd have to sit down and really work that out. But uh, as you know, the Chicagoland area, with all of the background, with all of the possibilities, everything from the Fort Dearborn Massacre to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, tragedies from the Eastland to Flight 191, um, gangsters and pioneers and... Uh, all kinds of colorful and eccentric individuals that make this city the vibrant place it is. They all add to uh, not only a material side of things, but also a psychic side. If there is such a thing as ghosts, if there is, need we fear them? I have... Uh, In other words, do they represent evil? Eddie, I've never found a ghost that uh, I felt in any way to be potentially harmful. And uh, we've taken many phone calls over the years, we've done many programs together, and... Uh, I think that of those few calls that we've gotten over the years where mm -hmm. people might be a bit apprehensive, I think it was more fear of the unknown than anything else that uh, put that perhaps uh, fear of, of the ghostly fear of something, fear of, fear of the unknown, actually, mm -hmm. into these people. If you want a doctor, Richard, our telephone number is 591-7200. We, we do have to, uh, I think, in order to be true to our, our colors and our history, don't I? I have to get the great ghost hunter to tell a great ghost story. I think that's uh, that's what you do best. I think someday, usually they record all of these on audio tape or write them all, because I know we've been bugging you about writing them all for years, and one day you must lock yourself away and do it. But um, well, I have a I, uh, I have a new story for you, Ed. Which uh, I, uh, uh, I don't think I've mentioned this at all to you before, and it's a story that I just picked up on a few months ago while I was doing some work at Rose Hill Cemetery. A very famous place. A very famous cemetery, and I don't believe I've told this one to you before. I right, know, this is... Uh, but a brand new story that I'm currently uh, uh, gathering more information on involves the ghost of Bobby Franks. Oh, the... Young man who was kidnapped by uh, Loeb and... Uh, Leopold and Loeb. Yes. yes, a very uh, savage killing of uh, little Bobby Franks from those two University of Chicago students of years ago. And uh, the case always did strike me as being, uh, uh, of course, quite tragic, quite poignant. And eventually, I don't know, I sort of filed away, filed away the historical data in the back of my mind. And I was up at Rose Hill, and from one of the uh, employees at Rose Hill, learned a very interesting story. Uh, Bobby Franks' grave actually his in internment, is in a small crypt there at Rose Hill, which was pointed out to me. And while I was there at Rose Hill, I was shown that, and the caretaker was telling me that earlier, with older employees there at the cemetery, Bobby Franks was reported seen around the crypt. And he did haunt the area on a regular basis Ooh. until Leopold died in Puerto Rico. Loeb, of course, was killed in a prison brawl, in a shower uh, situation. And Leopold went on to win parole. Leopold won parole. Yeah. And, of course, at the time of the trial, with Clarence Darrow as the attorney, uh, uh, on their behalf, they beat the uh, what everybody thought would be a certain death penalty for that heinous crime. And uh, Leopold and Loeb were sentenced to life in prison, and only after the second of the killers died, apparently did little Bobby Franks find peace. So a very tragic uh, postscript to a very tragic and poignant story. Ooh, that's a new one. I've never heard that before. It's ten minutes before the hour of one. Of all the stories you tell, of all the places you go, of all the legends, is, is Resurrection Mary still the most famous one of them all? Resurrection Mary's stature seems to grow every year, Ed, and... Uh, 
I, I think that, uh, with good reason, who can really say no to a ghost story like that? Who can uh, say that that's not uh, perhaps uh, such an all-American type presentation of, of an attractive girl in a white ballroom party dress who comes back to attend dances, who needs a ride? Uh, it has all the uh, hallmarks of an American classic, you know, the, the pretty girl, the automobile, and... Uh, Dark, dark and Lonely Roads, uh, it's got all the hallmarks of a classic. Well, I must, I must ask you to tell this, being that it's the, the most famous, and it seems to have given rise to other hitchhiking ghost stories all over the uh, North American continent. But this is apparently the original, and the Chicago area is its home. How far back in time are we going for this? Okay, now when we talk about hitchhiking ghost stories, of course, that we're talking about a, a genre that uh, really goes back in time. There's a hitchhiking ghost uh, who used to get rides in wagons, uh, well before the advent of the automobile in Ireland between County Cork and uh, County Tipperary. Uh, this was a girl who would uh, hitch a ride in a wagon to go to a dance. So there are stories worldwide like this of somebody who needs a ride to get somewhere, usually a party or a dance or something. Mm -hmm. And yet the Resurrection Mary stories around Chicago are so very well documented that there's no doubt that something's taking place. And we've got a long stretch of Archer running from the southwest side of Chicago through the old ethnic neighborhoods there on the southwest side out through the suburbs, through Justice, for instance, and Resurrection Cemetery, right there along Justice, uh, along Archer and Justice between uh, 79th Street and about 72nd Street. And then we follow Archer further down as it heads south by southwest on its way to Lamont. And as we head further down in Willow, uh, in Willowbrook, uh, I'm sorry, Willow Springs, we have the Willowbrook Ballroom. And there at the ballroom, of course, many stories that this is the spot that Resurrection Mary would come to attend dances at. But uh, there are a number of different ways in which the manifestation has occurred over the years. Perhaps the classic and the one that uh, has been, of course, uh, uh, mimicked or picked up on in various movies and short stories and everything is the hapless fellow who meets the girl at the dance, becomes totally infatuated with her, asks the girl because she seems to know no one else there if she would like a ride home. The girl accepts and she has the driver take her out a dark and lonely stretch of road only to tell him to stop and at that point bids farewell in a very spectacular way by telling him he can't follow as she runs across the road to the cemetery and disappear either at or through the cemetery gates and that story of course has happened a few times around resurrection cemetery and then we have uh, a lot of other additional backup uh, anecdotal material about people who have uh, seen the girl walking along the cemetery fence seen her walking uh, across the cemetery to run towards the fence to disappear and so on some very very well documented cases of course in recent years including a, a deacon from the uh, church out there holy cross creek orthodox who uh, was written up in usa today halloween of 1985 uh, by denny johnson who i believe is a friend of yours denny johnson a stringer for the mm -hmm. usa today and that deacon while driving home after the last service of Sunday, at the end of August of 1980, saw Resurrection Mary, or certainly a girl fitting her description, a blonde in a white dress, standing near the main gates along Archer. And as he drove up towards her and saw her, really not quite believing what he was seeing, because he had heard the story many times before, the girl disappeared before his eyes. And his just one of many documented accounts that there's something very special taking place, either along the side of Resurrection Cemetery or somewhere along the length and breadth of Archer as it runs through the southwest side. Who was she, do we know? That is a uh, very controversial uh, topic. I, I, I know that... Uh, and we've talked about that before, Ed. And uh, I, I think that we're, we're sort of... Uh, putting the uh, cart before the horse and we worry about who was the girl in life who became the ghost after death. And part of the problem with identifying one specific girl is the great size of Resurrection Cemetery. Because... Uh, at least as of two years ago, the last count I saw was 138,000 graves, which is certainly a very large cemetery. And according to a friend of mine from the uh, archives of the archdiocese, it would appear that Resurrection, if not the largest cemetery uh, in North America, is certainly the largest cemetery in the United States. So in other words, you say that we, because of that we may never know? Well, we've got controversy, let's put it that way. And there are people who've pinned their hopes on one girl or another. But to me, the important thing is not what happened years ago, but what goes on to this very day with the reports of this girl seen somewhere out that way, uh, acting up in her ghostly fashion. How recent have sightings been? She's been fairly quiet the last few years, Ed, but maybe we can elicit some phone calls tonight. Uh, maybe some listener out there who's ready to talk finally after an incubation period of a while is <laughs> willing to speak to some people who uh, uh, certainly would, would listen seriously because the problem with a Resurrection Mary type encounter, the problem with a ghostly uh, uh, encounter of a uh, very dramatic sort like that is that uh, 
do you really want to talk about it? Do you really want to open yourself up to potential laughter, ridicule? Because ghostly encounter is a very intensely personal thing. And I often have, uh, uh, and after years of developing uh, certainly a reputation for listening uh, uh, seriously to stories like this, I often have a hard time breaking the ice with certain people to get them to open up and talk about this freely. I see we're getting a call from somebody who wants to discuss it right now. Katie? Hi. Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? Yeah, you're uh, talking to Richard Crow, the ghost hunter. What did you want to say about Resurrection Mary? Oh, I think you are the best. You are so great. Um, there's been no sightings recently? No, not to my knowledge, Katie, but uh, if you can stir a few up for me. Uh, or... They're looking every which way, trying to figure out if it's her or not. I bet there'll be a lot of people out there tomorrow night driving around, won't there? There'll be a lot of people out this weekend, that's that's without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it, it's strange. I just, it's so cool, you know? <laughs> I just wanted, I just was really interested if there was anything new. I'm afraid not, but, um, you know, some people think that maybe those new streetlights out there have been uh, perhaps putting a jinx on the reports in uh, the last few years, but I sort of doubt that. I mean, y you look at things like The Ghost of Flight 401, the book and the movie uh, by that name, or you look at concepts like phone calls from the dead. I don't think technology in any way inhibits ghosts. If anything, ghosts can take over technology and use it for their own ends. Oh, that's true. So don't worry about the ghosts. They're going to be around for a long time. They're going to be able to uh, survive and cope and come into the uh, 1980s and 1990s with us. So she hasn't been seen. No, not in recent years. Wrong? Well, not not to, not to our knowledge, but uh, uh, as I say, there's probably somebody out there with a story or two right. that uh, is sitting on that and keeping that uh, uh, to themselves. Thanks for your call. Thank you. Thank you, now. All right, there goes Katie. This is WGN 591-7200 is our number if you have anything to add to uh, some of these legends. Uh, another call for you, Joe. Hello, Eddie. How are you? Good, Joe. How are you tonight? Oh, I can't complain. Hey, Richard, I just want to say hi. Yes, Joe. I was one of those people who organized a trip from Beverly uh, last day, April, or the May of 86. Uh-huh. And we really had a great time, and I just want to let everybody know that it's more than worth it to go on your tour, because I'll tell you, we had a great time. Great. I hope we didn't scare you that night, though. <laughs> well... You know, you know how it works with with the tours. If if you don't want to believe in ghosts, that's fine. But I'll certainly show you parts of the city you've never seen before, and give you a lot of a, a very heavy dose of uh, local history right. and folklore and legend. And you'll certainly come away, uh, certainly at least scratching your head with wondering about possibilities. Well, we appreciate it real well. Thank you, Joe. Take Thank care. you. Do any any unusual things ever happen on the tours you've given? Hundreds of tours over the years. Anybody come away uh, frightened? Well, as recently as two days ago, Ed, uh, uh, for those listeners who watched uh, Rick Kogan uh, do the piece on me on Channel 2 at the uh, 430 News, Rick Kogan met my boss at the Red Lion Pub uh, just two nights ago. And as we were there in the Red Lion, uh, the second floor is the haunted section of that bar. Ooh. And the second floor is where the ghost walks from the west end to the east end of the building and where cold spots have been encountered and where Colin Cordwell, the uh, manager there at the Red Lion, has felt things like a, uh, a feeling of apprehension, like he better mm. not be there and uh, things, things like that. And uh, well, first of all, I should preface this by saying that three weeks ago last Sunday, uh, I had heard all these stories about the Red Lion. I collected a lot of uh, anecdotes from people who were there, and I felt it was a perfect place to add to my tour for Halloween. So Colin and I were on the second floor discussing logistics, how we're going to bring buses through and not swap the kitchen with orders and things like that. And as we were up on the second floor, the haunted area, but we only went up there to get some peace and uh, quiet from the rest of the uh, people down below. The second floor only opened during uh, peak periods. Colin and I suddenly looked at one another and were saying, like, well, what kind of perfume do you have on? What kind of cologne do you have on? Because of a very, very strong scent of a violet, uh, lavender, lilac, just a, a real reeking type, uh, overdone, uh, flowery perfume. And, of course, neither one of us had any kind of aftershave or cologne on that would uh, in any way uh, be like that. And that happened uh, three weeks ago last Sunday. But two nights ago with Rick Kogan, we had five people in the group uh, almost having uh, fits as they were running around the area just where Colin and I had experienced this three weeks ago, and they were experiencing the same thing. And I was there. Sure enough, they called me over. I smelled it. And this perfume smell was going on right at the same area, the top of the stairs, a spot where the cold spot had occurred before and where we had smelled the perfume before. It's apparently quite a uh, real uh, intense haunted area right there on the second floor. Ooh, you got me all... You're going to have to drop by and check that place out. Have a little dessert. All right, we're going to take a little break and come back. Richard Crow, the ghost hunter, is here. If you'd like to go on his tour, we'll give you the address to write to for the brochure that Richard sends out. We'll do that right after the news. Right here at WGN Chicago, our Halloween morning program 
in progress. And it's time once again to uh, welcome Jim Boutet, who's in tonight for Jim Coleman, who's out trick-or-treating uh, a day early, I believe. And James, why don't you give us this uh, first news of uh, Halloween morning? If the Sun-Times is right, Leroy Martin is the next Chicago police superintendent. Fred Rice resignation takes effect this coming Sunday, and the Sun-Times is headlining a report that says Martin will be named as the mayor's choice for the job this weekend. At the moment, Martin is the deputy chief of patrol on the west side. He's been on the force for 32 years. The Chicago City Council has approved a new school tax, an increase of $134 million. WGN's Avis Lavelle says it was a close one. Aldermen argued for two and a half hours over whether the $698 million tax levy should be passed before school reform becomes reality. It takes 26 votes to pass the levy, and the vote was 24 to 21 the first time when three Hispanic aldermen took a walk. They came back to vote for the levy once Alderman Luis Gutierrez says their point was made about school reform, particularly in the Hispanic community. And for Bird, you can you can say to us that we're going to be included. We just have demonstrated to you. How that often do tourists go out? Will you be going out all winter, or do you take a break? Uh, and would you give the address for your Chicago Supernatural guided bus tour? Sure, Ed. Well, right now. <clears throat> I've been going out every night. That's why my voice is a bit straight tonight. I've been going out about every night for about 20-some days right now, plus a number of days. And I will be uh, running tours all the way up through uh, Christmas or beyond a bit. We'll see what happens there. But there's still plenty of chances to take part in it. And you can take part too, Ed. We'll oh, get yes. you on board one of these days. But for everybody else out there, I'm only going don't out wait for Ed. Come on right. and uh, take one uh, anytime. And just drop me a line, Richard Crow, C R O W E, at box 29054, 29054, Chicago 60629. The tour I want to go on is the one they put together for women only. I've had those tours. I had Hinkley and Schmidt. I had all women on for my Hinkley Schmidt tour oh, really? I did here a few weeks ago. And, uh,. I'm trying to think what other unusual tours I've done lately. Oh, I get them all. I, as you know, I've done tours, just busfuls of magicians, busfuls of clowns, busfuls bus of was reported, politicians. Uh, yes. And that busful of magicians you did was reported missing over nine times during the tour. It kept disappearing. We don't know what happened. Oh, Eddie. Uh, uh, I couldn't help myself. Very good. Got a couple of calls for you here, and uh, let me answer them. Hello, Bill. Yes. How are you? Fine. How are you tonight? Good. Listen, uh, about five or six years ago, I was listening to... Uh, uh, show like yours tonight, and they were talking about the resur resurrection, Mary, and supposedly a, a gentleman investigated the all the reports, and he found out that out of like five or six gentlemen that reported citing her uh, that had no knowledge of each other, no, didn't know anybody, that during their description, it was identical. So, like people that were from Wisconsin or different areas of town cited this person had given a to a police artist a description of her and they all came out as being one girl so that there is something out there i have never cited it but from listening about five uh -huh. or six years ago that's what i heard and i was wondering I think that the description of the police artist thing is uh, perhaps a bit apocryphal. Although uh, <clears throat> there have been many people who've seen her and the descriptions are, are quite close. One thing about this, Ed, and I've asked this by women quite often, it's like, what was the style of the dress, right? Mm -hmm. And you ask mm -hmm. a guy, what's the style of the dress? They go, it's a white dress. You know, they don't pay attention to style like that. At least the, the guys on the south side who've seen Resurrection Mary haven't. But uh, maybe other parts of town, they might pay more attention to uh, fabric and uh, uh, that sort of thing. But... Uh, uh, otherwise, the descriptions are quite uh, quite close. I would have to admit that. No, yeah. I, thank you, sir. Thank you. Do you have any idea what the official attitude is of the, let's say, the Justice Illinois Police Department, which is the police department with the jurisdiction over the cemetery? Well, Ed, as, as, as you know, over the years, we've talked to uh, uh, many different police departments, and there's, there's usually two attitudes, the official attitude and the uh, mm -hmm. off-the-record attitude. And among my best informants uh, for information, not only about Resurrection Mary, but many other cases as well, um, it's the off-the-record uh, policeman who, uh, he's out there in the front line, he's out there at night, he's out there, uh, you know, really out there having the experiences, and those are some of my best sources. What about the Archdiocese? What's well, their, what's their attitude? Once again, uh, you, you've got this uh, split personality type syndrome, uh, I'm afraid, from time to time that uh, officially perhaps uh, things are denied or suppressed and otherwise. Some of my best stories, some of the material that I heard about years ago that got me sort of thrust into this area, uh, stories that I heard from uh, people like my uh, 
uh, parish priest at Visitation Parish, Father Charles Carmody, who's now deceased, who told me many stories about the West Side area, particularly Holy Family Church and the Great Chicago Fire and that uh, that era of history. And uh, my Latin professor uh, years ago, Father John Nicola, who later became the advisor of the movie The Exorcist. Uh, these were people who really inspired me by giving me some firsthand good background of the history and the uh, the, the really literary background here be, behind some of these stories. Back we go to our WGN telephone, and let's see, Naomi. Uh, yes, good morning. Good morning. I was wondering if there have been any sightings of Julia Bucola from Mount Carmel Cemetery. Uh, Julia's been uh, fairly quiet, at least for apparitions in recent years. <clears throat> uh, that's the girl that we refer to as the Italian bride, who's been seen uh, along the Harrison Street side of the cemetery. The uh, the last uh, good account that I know of that I can, uh, with any surety, uh, uh, say occurred would probably be the one from uh, September of 1978. However, uh, there have been reports of a, a set of roses at her grave. And, uh, excuse me, the uh, rose scent... Uh, at the grave I had never even known about prior to uh, an incident back in 1981. I was out there with a tour in March of 1981, uh, mm -hmm. a tour for Notre Dame High School on Mango. I do a, uh, a tour every uh, uh, every spring for Notre Dame. They, they're very good. They bring me back every year to speak on campus and do some tours. And with 45 people present, that included the bus driver, the teachers, the students, and myself, 40 people of 45 smelled a very distinctive, totally... Uh, uh, strong and unmistakable set of roses at the graveside. Five did not for some reason. I took a count later. But we then found out, at least at dawn of me later, that, hey, wait a minute, this occurred within a couple of days of the anniversary of the death of Julia, who died March 17th of 1921. So uh, we have perhaps not the manifestations as dramatic as you might want with a visual apparition, but uh, ghosts don't always give you all you want. They do it their own way, and uh, that's been happening a few times. Why this one young girl um, is so well known? Why... Do people know her name, and why is uh, her grave a stop along the way, so to speak? Yeah, the story of Juliet is, is very well known in the uh, and I mean, West suburbs. And let me just call her, and uh, we'll, we'll hear the story, okay? Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Bruce. The uh, story of Julia is very well known in the western suburbs, and it's also extremely well known among Italian-American circles around Chicago, because Julia was from the west side of Chicago. In fact, she was from uh, just the, the Taylor Street area. In fact, uh, the west side is where she grew up. And uh, after marrying and moving further west, she eventually would pass on, uh, in a childbirth, uh, bad childbirth situation. She had a stillborn baby and she died in the, uh, in the process of uh, trying to give birth. And the mother and child were buried together in the same coffin, as was often the custom back in those days. And because it was her first child, and according to old Sicilian custom, she was buried in the white of her wedding day in her wedding dress. So she's depicted on the monument out there at Mount Carmel Cemetery in the wedding dress, which has caused some confusion. But after the girl had uh, passed out and been buried uh, for some period of time, her mother began to experience a series of strange dreams, as, from what I've been able to piece together, which eventually led to the grave being exhumed and the body of Julia being found in perfect condition. The baby had turned to bones and dust, but Julia was in perfect condition, and uh, that was the start of a whole series of miraculous and uh, alleged paranormal events that took place out there, which include... Not only the body, perhaps still being in perfect condition, we don't know because it has not been checked and, uh, since 1958 was the last burial out there. Nobody checked at that point. But uh, we have the girl seen on occasion walking along the cemetery fence, and we have the set of roses that occurs out there at the grave. So there's a whole series of events that take place out there. That's a fascinating story. Ooh. Have you, uh... Well, in fact, you know, the interesting thing, too, about that, Ed, which is uh, plain for everybody to see who would ever venture out there to the Harrison Street side of Mount Carmel, is that so many pilgrims come out there to visit the grave that grass does not grow in front of the monument. It's worn away by the knees, by the feet of the pilgrims who come there and pray and stand there and take it all in and read the inscriptions on the, on the monument. It just, they, they sodded that place, they resod it once, twice a year, doesn't do any good, the grass is worn away. And that's more than you can say about Al Capone, who uh, everybody thinks is the most popular grave out there to be visited at Mount yeah, Carmel. Right. But even Al himself at least has grass over the spot where he's buried. But Julia has such a steady flow of people. And sometimes they've even found uh, lipstick stains on the photographs Ooh. where the... Uh, over-emotional sometimes come and kiss the photographs on the monument. Hoping for a blessing, huh? Isn't that amazing? W.G. Adam on our Halloween program, Richard Crow, the Ghost Hunter, is right here. And Steve, how are you? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Richard. Good evening, Steve. I always enjoy uh, this, this show particularly. I am a regular listener. Thank and, you. And uh, I 
I work for a sheriff's department up here in Wisconsin, and uh, tonight, fortunately, I had the night off, so I was able to listen at home. But uh-huh. the nights when I'm out on the road, I by the time the show gets over, I always find myself looking in the rearview mirror more than usual. <laughs> by the, time the, night's over. Mm. the question I had, Richard, was that uh, do you approach these, these stories and these investigations as a prover of, as a disprover of, or simply as an investigator? And I also wanted to know is, did you start one way and perhaps change your direction as you, uh, as you progress through the years? Well, uh, first of all, I, I should say that I started out of an intense curiosity about the material, not quite knowing where it would wind up, and I, I've sort of developed an approach over the years to how to get to uh, the bottom of uh, ferreting out information. But uh, over the years, I've certainly solved many cases. I'm, uh, I'm still uh, despised and vilified uh, by students from St. Joe's College in Rensselaer, for instance, for having exposed their ghost light of Francisville, Indiana, for being just an optical illusion caused by headlights of cars in the distance. And uh, I, I catch flack from both sides. I catch flack from people who are... I suppose pretending to be skeptics, but are actually bigots who can't admit to any of this being uh, possible. Mm. And then I catch flack from the true believers who think that I'm uh, solving too many things and coming to uh, natural explanations for things, which uh, they want to d- deep in their heart. I sp- you know, thing, and there, there are those, of course, on the other side of the fence who, for whatever reason, just want to say this is real and this is just the way it is and this is the way it has to be. Yeah, you've got to be able to uh, uh, be very uh, careful as to uh, how you approach it and uh, what your final decisions are. And, of course, there are many cases that uh, I suppose are still open, but uh, I've met enough uh, instances of things that I can't explain, that I've done my best, my level best to try to explain, and I'm sure there's something unusual taking place that's beyond our current level of understanding. It's certainly always interesting. Always a pleasure to listen to it. Thank you. How about about your area of Wisconsin? Do you have any good stuff up that way? Not really, uh, although... Uh, well, in our county, we've had uh, uh, three or four unsolved murders uh, that, well, at one point we tried to uh, tie in with the ge- uh, one of the gentlemen who was uh, in Texas, uh, arrested in Texas, uh, Otis Toole or something like that. And, uh, no, the other I remember one, him, yeah. Yeah, the other one was in Florida. But uh, no real stories, you know anything on the side of the road, because we have plenty of, it's basically a rural county, uh-huh. uh, but no, no real stories uh, for, for the types of crimes that we've had. Apparently. Well, keep us in mind and let us know if you come up with anything. I certainly will. Thanks for the call. Thank Always a pleasure. Bye-bye. This is WGN Chicago. Richard Crow, the ghost hunter, is here. Hello. Hi, good morning, Eddie. Good morning. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Chicago, Wicker Park. Okay. Uh, I'd like to speak to Richard. Richard. Yes. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, I know you're familiar with the Ouija board. I've been getting some frightening information from Ouija board threats, and uh, what I want to know, I want to know where the energy comes from on this Ouija board, and can I bring an entity into my home, an evil spirit or whatever? Uh Uh-huh. I can? Well, let me just say that uh, uh, regarding Ouija boards, I've been cautioning people for the longest time, don't mess with Ouija boards, because you can really open yourself up to a lot of problems. And you've got a number of different areas where you can open yourself up to a problem. One possibility is, yes, you can bring in an entity, I believe, from somewhere else. But perhaps even more frightening would be uh, uh, the problem which uh, Dr. A.R.G. Owen of Canada came up with some years ago in the uh, book, Philip the Imaginary Ghost, that uh, actually you can create thought forms. You can actually uh, sort of create a uh, split personality type problem and feed the information into it through your subconscious and not realize you're doing that. Uh, it's it's too detailed, I suppose, to go into in a few minutes. Uh, quick, glib answer right now. I understand. However, if you're interested in this study, I would certainly recommend Dr. A. R. G. Owen's study called Philip the Imaginary Ghost. And you read that, and you see the possibility, the frightening possibilities of what you can put yourself into. And this is not even talking about external entities, but just from dabbling and playing with your own mind, which is not the smartest thing to do. And read that book, and Owen is a well-established uh, Canadian researcher, and I, I think you'll probably toss that Ouija board out the window. Well, what you're saying, see, I, may, I home make mine. And well, I, I don't care if it's a, a Parker Brothers version or if it's one you, you make yourself. It's a dangerous thing to toy with, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, then I'll definitely leave it alone. Well, I mean, uh, certainly I think you should follow up and uh, uh, check some of the research, like uh, the Owen book, because uh, believe me, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bad thing to tamper with, a horrible thing to uh, uh, mess with and let it rule your life, okay. because too many people can become, uh, uh, too many people don't have the strong will to put it down. It just uh, takes over their life. Well, thank you. All right, we appreciate your call. It's WGN Chicago, and Joe, how about you? Ah, good morning, gentlemen. Mm-hmm. You know what, Parker Brothers should get that uh, game off the air. I mean, off, off the... Off the uh, market? Yeah, off the market, I'm yeah, sorry. Maybe, maybe they should. 
Yeah, yeah because uh, too many people are already nuts about uh, nuts without having that game already. You're right. Well, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, the question I want to ask, uh, I've always wanted to ask uh, Mr. Crow this question ever since uh, he first started having him on. Um, Mr. Crow, have there been any store, uh, cases that you haven't covered because they're too either bizarre or too demonic? Too bizarre, too demonic. Too bizarre, too demonic. Well, here around the Chicago that area, I uh, I really can't say that I've come up with anything uh, quite like that. Too bizarre, too demonic. Uh huh. Well, yeah, I just want to know if there are any cases that you've heard about but have never, you know, touched. Uh, not really, not anything that I've gone into in depth. I, I've never found anything. Uh, see, I, number one, I don't dabble in the demonic, so I, I, I really pretty much draw the line at that. Yeah. And uh, I just isolate myself from that sort of thing. All right, thank you very much for the call. WGN, hello, Tom. Oh, uh, yes, um, I was wondering, I want to ask Richard something about... Okay. Uh, yeah. About um, Bachelor's Grove. A very popular spot. Oh, uh, well, I've heard stuff... A teacher today, I'm in high school, and a teacher today was telling us a story about a blue light that uh, would, like, you, you'd see it sometimes, like, going through the forest and stuff. Right. Did you hear about that? It's been out there for a long time. I've been hearing about those stories since the 60s. Yeah, that's when he said he saw it. Uh huh. Okay, and I was wondering if there was any more sightings lately of the blue light. A, a policeman friend of ours, Ed, who uh, I talked to the other day on the tour, had seen this light, I believe, as recently as three years ago. Why don't we explain why this area is uh, interesting? And thank you very much for the call. Go back and turn your radio on, okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, Bachelor's Grove is perhaps one of the most famous um, places in our area where people like to visit. And look for the, uh, the un un yeah, look for the unknown, huh? Because you've got a yeah, lot of possibilities. Where is this area, or, or and what is it, and why is it so famous? Well, Bachelors Grove Cemetery is on 143rd Street, just east of Ridgeland. Mm -hmm. It's near suburban Midlothian, and it's out of the forest preserves right now. Mm -hmm. But at one time, there was a small little farming community out that way, and these were settlers from Germany who were bachelors, and that's where the name Bachelors Grove had come from. And eventually, as they would pass on and need a place to be buried, they had married, of course, by then, and were raising families. This became the family plot for all those original settlers. And for some reason over the years, the spot acquired a reputation, which I, I, I really feel is quite well-deserved, that it's haunted. And among stories that I heard about from the 60s and was able to track down were stories about a, a blue ghost light out there in the woods, a blue light that would bounce around and be seen around the graves in that area. Uh, there also were reports of a uh, house that was seen, a wooden house. Now, there's no wooden house out there today, but some stone foundations out of the woods would show that uh, houses did exist out there, probably for the Civil War era up through uh, after the turn of the century sometime to maybe the early 1920s, before that area became consolidated in the Forest Preserve District, and the houses were knocked down, and it was reforested for use in the, uh, in the park district. So we've got uh, a number of different reports of things taking place there. But perhaps the most impressive evidence for anything taking place out there of a paranormal nature is photographic. And that discovery was made by a good friend of mine from Oak Lawn, Tony Vasey, who uh, was able to make a discovery in 1974, which is yet to be uh, disproved or actually explained. It's, it's, it's still quite mysterious. What, what was it he discovered? Tony was out there with a Polaroid color camera taking pictures, and he found that uh, out there but invisible to the human eye. To be caught on film, however, would be greenish-white mists, uh, images that are out there that can be caught on film. And you don't know you've got it until you take a picture of it, your picture comes out and it's developed. And Tony has something in excess, I believe, of about 200 shots now that were taken at different times over the years. Really? And every so often I'll go out there with Tony, we'll try and do experiment, and uh, the, the pictures have been looked at by some very uh, famous researchers such as Dr. Peter Bander of London, England, when he was in town uh, uh, for a conference that uh, my friend Joe Trioni organized out at uh, Joliet Junior College some years ago, and many other people, too, have uh, checked into this, and there's no explanation for this. It's certainly intriguing. It shows there's something taking place out there, and uh, may I suggest anybody out there looking for a great high school science fair project, uh, try psychic photography. You could certainly uh, get the adjudicator stumped and probably win a scholarship with that one. Is that a Lover's Lane area? Uh, yeah, that's not only a uh, Lover's Lane area, but unfortunately the uh, area has uh, acquired such a sinister reputation for the people out there, not the, uh, uh, the dead, that uh, it was all in that area that was put under a dust till dawn curfew back in 1977 by George Dunn of the county board. And so it, that way. Yeah, it, it's, it's a shame that it got uh, so bad from uh, activity of an illicit sort that it had to be uh, ruled off limits for most people. All right, Richard Crow, the ghost hunter, is here. Hello, Michael. Hi there, it must be me. 
That's you. Okay, I was wondering if um, you or your, you know, your guests had ever heard of a place up in Lake Forest. I'm calling from up in the north side, you know, north suburbs. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we were back in school, there was all sorts of, you know, I guess the best thing to call them would be legends about a place called McCormick Mansion. Uh huh. Up in, you know, it's like right on the the border of Fort Sheridan, just as you're going into Lake Forest, <laughs> and. Um, they were supposed to be, you know, the legend goes, you know, something crazy like he was supposed to have been like a satanic priest or something back in the early 1900s, you know, and, you know, there's, you know, the place was a beautiful mansion, but there's like all sorts of caverns and stuff, you know, and like real strange things have been seen there, you know, and, you know, I, I don't know, you know, this one story, you kind of fed on the next or if it was, you know, if any of it was, you know, like even the remotely, you know, possibly true. Did you ever hear of anything about That's it? That's not the old Schweppe mansion, is it? No, it's called McCormick Mansion. Uh -huh. I, I don't know if, yeah, I, I, I guess he had to do something with, um, you know, McCormick Place on Chicago or McCormick uh -huh. Seasoning or something. But, you know, the, the man was supposed to be unbelievably rich and, in fact, donated part of uh, his, his mansion to Fort Sheridan when it was first built, I guess, or something, something of those lines, you know, part of his uh -huh. property. But, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful mansion, you know, um, right on the lake. And, Is uh, somebody in there now? No, no. As a matter of fact, for years and years, this place was um, deserted, you know, and it was, there was just ruins there. There was, like, you know, underground caverns going from the bluff, you know, to the uh, different parts of the mansion. And, you know, uh, there was a tomb out there and, you know, all sorts of different things. And, uh, you know, the, the, the only thing that happened when, you know, that was weird when I was there was, you know, we used to sit there going there for, you know, for dates or something like that just to scare, you know, the, the people you're with or something. But um, I was there, like, two days in a row. And one day I was out on a, a cliff out there on the bluff, and the next day I came back, and uh, that tree that I was, like, leaning up against was, like, you know, 75 yards, you know, down the, the, the cliff there. But, you know, just looking into the caverns and stuff is real weird. But have you heard anything about it? No, it doesn't, doesn't ring a bell, uh, although if anybody could give me more information, I'd, I'd love to know about it. It was, it was a big legend yeah. when I was back in school, you know, a bunch of people on the North Shore, you know, I don't know if, you know, if anybody out there, you know, heard anything, if, you know, maybe, you know, some of the listeners might call in or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks for the story. Okay. That's fascinating. I wonder if any of the local newspapers up there have ever written about it. Well, the most famous uh, mansion up there in Lake Forest, of course, Eddie, was the, uh, uh, the Schweppe Mansion, well, the story which was that. abandoned for 41 years after the uh, former owner committed suicide Ooh. and tied it up in his will that it could not be sold for that period of time. And eventually it was purchased by uh, new owners, and I was up there for a private party earlier this year and put out a presentation there, which was quite a thrill to be able to get into that place, which had been abandoned for so long, which now is being rehabbed by the current owners. Did the people live in it? I'm not sure if they moved in yet, but it was being rehabbed at the time, and I was there for a uh, evening gown and black tie dinner. It was uh, uh, quite a, a very interesting thing to be invited to. I remember reading about that in the paper. That was in the Tribune, right. Yeah. I do get some very interesting offers from time yeah, to time. You do. You I have known of uh, for some time and have told us about a bar somewhere in Chicago that is haunted by, a, I believe, either a former bartender or a patron where they... Actually put a glass of beer out and he comes and drinks it? Oh, no, he doesn't drink beer, he drinks vodka. Vodka? <laughs> what, what's that story? No, that's the uh, Castle Pub on North Broadway. Tell us about that. And the Castle Pub is now a Scottish pub, ah. the only Scottish pub in town. But prior to that, uh, it was a shot beer joint back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. So any of the people listening out here tonight who are big 50s fans, well, they, they would have loved the uh, Frank Gift, the owner of the Castle uh, the owner of what is now the Castle Pub, which was just Frank's place back in those days. Frank drank himself to death behind the bar fell backwards off the bar still after drinking shot after shot of vodka. And uh, to this day, uh, Jane McDougall, the owner of the Castle Pub, still uh, uh, strongly averse that uh, he drinks vodka. He comes back to uh, help himself whenever he wants to. And she wakes up, and, or rather after, after a night's sleep, she uh, comes into the bar and often finds an empty vodka glass on the bar? Well, what, what would happen is uh, Jane would be uh, creative enough to mark the level of vodka with a piece of crayon, for Ooh. instance, on the bottle. And Jane was on the show with us a few years ago. That's right. And told the story, and uh, Jane's been able to document that quite well. Well, I've had experiences there at the Castle Pub, as have many other people on my tours. Now, that's one of my ordinary nighttime stops. And at the spot where Frank died, which has been, the place has been remodeled, so it's now changed mm -hmm. totally. But at the spot where he died back in 1959, when he was 59 years of age, there is almost always a cold spot on the floor. Now, it's not always discernible to everybody, but I would venture to say that maybe half the time I, I bring a tour in, somebody or more than a few on that bus will feel a very strong, cold feeling on the floor. The cold can affect the feet. Your toes get numb, your feet get numb, the coldness climbs up.
uh, up your feet, up your legs. And some people get more than that because a cold, clammy hand is sometimes materialized mm -hmm. to touch somebody, to grab somebody on the shoulder, even on the knee. And the odd thing about it, uh, Eddie, and this is one of the reasons why we're pretty sure we know who it is, who's behind this, it occurs right at the spot where Frank died, and the cold hand usually goes after a redhead or a blonde. And the reason for this, we feel, is because Frank's widow, when he was dying, at least she didn't know he, she was about to become the widow, Frank's wife was passed out in the washroom nearby. Oh. Was not there to lend a hand to Frank as he was dying. And, of course, time doesn't pass the way it does for you or I, when yeah. you're, especially when you're drunk and you're a ghost. And uh, Frank's out there you know, reaching out to touch somebody and reaching out for help and gets confused. And if you look anything at all like Edna, his wife, well... I think that might explain why uh, some people get a little bit more than just the cold spot. I'm glad I asked. Hello, Shirley. How are you? Okay, how are you? Good. Good show. Thank you. Um, hello to you and to Richard. And I'd like to ask about Monk's Castle. Okay. Is this a famous place? Another famous one. It's on my daytime tour. I talk all about Monk's Castle, which is better known, of course, under the name St. James Sag. Oh. Although, when I first heard about it, it was Monk's Castle. Back in my high school days, it's the second oldest Catholic church in the Chicago Diocese. Where is it? It's 107th Street in Archer, on the edge of Lamont. Right. And is it, that's not Chicago. That's not on the edge of Lamont. So uh, just uh, you, you leave Willow Springs, heading down Archer, south by southwest, mm -hmm. and just before you get to Lamont, it's there at the top of the hill, at the what, top of the Sag Ridge. What's famous about that? Why is it on your tour? Well, many, many stories about that place over the years, Ed, but the most prominent and where the nickname Monk's Castle comes from uh, deal with the fact that uh, many people have seen monks out there by night, and there are no physical mm -hmm. monks out there who live out there to account for that. And the best account that I have regarding this and believe me there have been many stories told and some of them are by people who uh, may not have been the best or most credible witness at the time of their alleged incident but i do have a very interesting two-page police report from a cook county police officer friend of mine from hickory hills who uh, in late 1979 encountered eight or nine figures in monk-like outfits milling around inside the cemetery he was driving by in a squad he saw these figures he yelled out to them to surrender come on out they paid no attention. He presumed they were trespassers at first, that they were perhaps some kind of vandals or maybe a cult or, a, a cult or something of that nature. So he runs into the cemetery after them. They're going to the top of the hill. He's after them in hot pursuit. Mm -hmm. And he gets there a few steps after they do. They're gone. He searches the area. He doesn't hear any twigs breaking or brush rustling or any indication for where they could have gone to. And he would fill out a police report later to account for his time. But he told me personally... Although he didn't say it in the report, in which he said he had chased mm -hmm. trespassers, he believes that what he had chased could not have been anything of this world, but must have been ghosts or phantoms. Uh, I wonder if our North Riverside buddy is out tonight in the cemetery. Yes, I wonder where John O'Rourke is tonight. He's probably out uh, this hour. He's probably out there trolling for ghosts in uh, Jewish Waldheim or yeah, Woodlawn right. or one of the other uh, associated cemeteries out there. Yeah, Sergeant O'Rourke, old buddy. And John, if you're out there, give us a call. I'm sure he's listening. Oh, he's, uh, he's quite the guy. Thank you very much for the call. Hello, uh, John. Who's this? Uh, this is John. John, where are you calling from? Uh, Chicago. Okay, you're on. Okay, good morning. Uh, Richard, Thank I wonder you. if you could give me everything you know about the... Uh all Souls Day incident at St. Rita's Church? Uh, I can't give you everything. It would take about a half an hour, but I'll okay. just uh, sir, uh, uh, just uh, give you a, a, very, very quick, uh, a very quick uh, surmise here of the, uh, of the report. In fact, I brought back the story this year, Eddie. We're now going down 63rd Street doing Murder Castle, mm -hmm. Dr. Mudgett, H.H. Uh, Holmes, and we're also doing uh, the story of St. Rita's on my Halloween run this year. Now, uh, before we begin this one, this is a very, very famous Chicago story. And we have, over the years, and you telling this, actually come upon a couple of people who were there that day. Yes, and knew, I... And knew enough about it to convince us that they were there. That's that's for sure, Ed. And uh, mm. uh, one gentleman who was there back then is now a Catholic priest. It certainly turned his life around, affected him profoundly. Mm -hmm. And there are people, as we've gotten phone calls over the years, that uh, can there. back up uh, the aspects of this case. Why don't you tell a bit about this? But... Uh, Quite briefly, the way it came down, and of course, I'm sure it was a lot more terrifying and a lot more detailed than what I'm about to say. It was on All Souls Day, November the 2nd of 1960, and back in those pre-Vatican II days, a standard practice to go to church to pray for the souls of your loved ones who've passed on, to uh, uh, raise them a notch or two out of purgatory and on their way. And as these two dozen or so people were there in the church, they were praying silently. Suddenly, the organ gave off some wild screeches. 
And those in the church, distracted from their prayers, turned around and looked to the organ loft to see what the problem was, thinking that maybe some teenager had been up there messing around at the keyboard or expecting something of that nature to explain it. When they turned around, there was nobody at the keyboard. The organ is empty, playing by itself, and on either side of the organ are hooded figures, three in white monk's robes on one side, three in black monk's robes on the other. These figures, faces hidden in the shadows and the, the hands hidden in the sleeves of the garments, certainly terrified the people to such an extent that uh, they all headed for the side doors on the Washtenaw and Fairfield side of the church to leave. There are triple doors along 63rd Street, Fairfield, and Washtenaw, bronze and glass. And these big, heavy doors, which w operated perfectly well uh, minutes before, now wouldn't budge. The people were there clawing, pulling, trying to get those doors to move. They couldn't get the doors open. The figures that were in the organ loft were now on the ground floor, gliding right through the pews as if the pews didn't exist. And as this was taking place, a voice was heard to whisper loudly, Pray for me. As that whispered plea was heard, the doors flew open by themselves as a cold breeze from inside the building blew out and opened those doors. Everybody escaped at that time, of course, getting out of there as quickly as they could. There are many people around the area who still can recount to this day, growing up in the area, uh, being talked to by Father McHale, who was the pastor at that time, who would go around to the various rooms of the grammar school and try to talk everybody into forgetting about it, not talking about it. The adults who were there that day were apprehended by uh, the authorities of the parish and asked to keep this quiet for the good of the church and, and that sort of thing. But a story like that could not be kept quiet, spread rapidly through the South Side. And, of course, uh, myself being just a uh, grammar school student at Visitation Parish, just a uh, short distance away back then, I heard it through the grammar school grapevine within a matter of days. It was the talk of the town. And eventually, after uh, entering into high school and uh, graduating from grammar school and meeting people from the area years later, was able to piece together the story, as, I, as I've now related it to it's you. it's still legendary. It's still legendary. And, you know, Ed... It frightens some people, but to me, it is the kind of a story that uh, has a great moral to it. It reminds me a lot of one of my favorite supernatural short stories, The Devil and Daniel Webster, remember, uh, which was made into that uh, classic black and white film, too. And uh, Dan Webster has to uh, debate the devil to uh, argue to save the soul of one of his constituents. And here we had the classic concept of a soul coming back with that whispered plea for prayers, and hopefully he or she, because we don't know the sex, just a whispered plea, he or she got whatever they needed and hopefully left with the good guys in white robes and not the bad guys in the black. This is W.G. Adams, Chicago, and you're listening to our Halloween visit with Richard Crow, the ghost hunter, and we're very glad that you're here tonight. We're going to break for a moment and come back. Uh, we, uh, we won't be on all night, unfortunately. We'll be on until 2 a.m., but uh, I think you can tell by what Richard's been talking about this morning, there's much to enjoy on the ghost tour, and you won't want to miss Chicago it. is the home of many landmarks, including two landmark high-tech companies, TechAids Industries and U.S. Robotics. Both have grown with the computer industry, and both have grown with Chicago. U.S. Robotics has been a data communications leader for more than 10 years. More than 40 of America's 50 biggest companies have chosen U.S. Robotics modems for superior value and reliability. With U.S. Robotics' new courier, HST modem, your computer can send or receive up to 1,700 characters a second over regular phone lines. Imagine the time and money you'll save. Priced at $9.95, Courier HST can pay for itself in just four hours of high-speed use. Compared with standard 1,200 baud modems, for the name of your nearest authorized U.S. robotics dealer, call Tech Aids Industries at 870-7400. That's 870-7400. Outside Illinois, call toll-free 1-800-323-4138. Choose the landmark and modems, U.S. Robotic, the intelligent choice in data communications. Amlings believes that sometimes words aren't enough. Flowers say it with more feeling, more love, more meaning. Just think of the effect you'll create when you send flowers from Amlings. Just dial A-M-L-I-N-G-S. It's 1.48 in the morning. We are joined by a second guest. I'd like uh, uh, Richard to help introduce this man. You, uh, we talked a little bit about his haunted place earlier. Colin Cordwell is the proprietor of the Red Lion? Or are you, what, 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 what do you do that? I'm the owner and the proprietor. All right, how are you? I'm all right tonight. We were talking about you earlier. Uh, where's your place located? Uh, 2446 North Lincoln. It's okay. just a little 
further north of the Biograph Theater on the other side of the street. What? Now, Richard was uh, telling us a little bit about what goes on in your place. Yes, oh. I, I, I discovered Colin uh, earlier this year, so to speak, and uh, uh, learned about uh, rumors that his place was haunted, went in to check it out, and lo and behold, it's a fabulous place, uh, good food, uh, uh, nice atmosphere, uh, uh, very convenial uh, atmosphere there, and of course, at least one ghost. I don't know. We still have to figure out just how many ghosts. We're just starting to come to grips with uh, some of the uh, possibilities. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, smelling perfume just three weeks ago uh, last Sunday, a whole new uh, uh, aspect of the, of the ghost came to light. How long have you owned the uh, place? It's going to be three years this November. Have you heard these stories before you took it over? No, no. As a matter of fact, when, when we opened up the pub, we really didn't know how authentic of an English pub we were going to have. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of pubs in England have their own ghosts. And... It was about a year after we opened that we started getting these phenomena. What, what are some of the other things you've experienced? Oh, uh, on Sundays, in the colder months, always on Sundays in the late afternoon, about 4 or 5 o'clock, someone will storm across the floor upstairs. I have two bars, one downstairs, one upstairs. Someone will storm across the floor from one end of the room to the other. My father said to me on more than a dozen occasions, tell whoever's up there to come down. It's not open. So I'd run upstairs. I'd check the doors, the bathrooms, nobody's there, the windows are locked. Ooh. I'd go up in the attic, fool that I am, and yeah. <laughs> check out the corners, nobody there. Does it scare you a bit? I mean, uh... yeah, it did one night, uh, in particular. Uh, this is the story I like to tell people, tell but kind of convinced me of it, and it's how I found the cold spot. I, start, I commenced a program uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I'm working on my master's in history. Mm -hmm. And one night after work, I, I was pulling a long shift, and I decided to study for my midterm the next day. I went up to the upstairs bar after work, put in about a half an hour's worth of reading and going over my notes, and decided to turn in. We had sofas upstairs. Mm -hmm. I fell asleep on the sofa, immediately went into a deep sleep, and woke up a half an hour later, abruptly, out of a deep sleep. And I, the whole room, the upstairs, was permeated with a feeling of dread, depression, and kind of a quasi-malevolence. Almost like I wasn't welcome there. And I could distinctly feel another presence in the room, standing about five feet behind me. I didn't dare look, and I said, get out of here. And the feeling went away. I went back to sleep. I woke up five minutes after, uh, 20 minutes after that, and it was even stronger. The third time it came back, it came back with the sound of a pop, like a champagne bottle had gone off at the front of the room. Mm -hmm. but, well, there aren't any bottles at the front of the room. So I decided to dig myself into the sofa until about 6.30 in the morning, and I finally got a, enough courage to leave. And as I crossed over the bar area, I, the temperature of the room was about 70, 72 degrees. And I, when I got to the top of the stairs, I hit the cold spot. Mm -hmm. you know, I said a haunted place has a cold spot. The temperature dropped about 20 degrees. I stepped out of it to see whether I was losing my mind, and it was 70 degrees again. I thought the air conditioning was on. Nothing was coming out of the vent. And as I went down the stairs, yeah, I had the distinct impression somebody was following me. And it was just as if someone was running an ice cube up and down my spine and the hair was standing up on the back of my head. Ooh. I guarantee you, I don't go up there anymore uh, without a baseball bat and a cross. Uh. <laughs> really? Richard, that sounds like the kind of place you ought to spend the night. Oh, that's a great place. We're, we're working on some ideas for experiments here to get to the bottom of the ghost. And uh, uh, as, as I've been telling you earlier, Eddie, uh, with the perfume aspect now that we discovered and such, that's right. uh, it seems to be uh, getting more pronounced or at least uh, diversifying in its uh, psychic possibilities. Yeah, I definitely had the feeling it was a she, too, when I was, when I was there. Do you know the history of the building? Yeah, the building was built in 1882, and it was... Lakeview, Illinois. It was the first suburb north That's of right. Chicago That's at the right. turn of the century. And I found a, 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 a milk bottle from the Hoffman Dairy Company of Lakeview, Illinois. Really? We were doing it. When I opened up the attic, that's when we first started experiencing this stuff. I found a copy of the Cincinnati Enquirer from 1883. Oh. Val Valentine's from the last century. Articles of clothing. And uh, it's interesting. Richard brought a psychic in about six months ago, and she checked the place out. She said, whatever you have here is female. Boy, boy, it would probably be fascinating to know the history of uh, whether or not any... It, it was a bookie violent. joint. It was? It was? It, back in the um, 30s and 40s, my next-door neighbor told me uh, they used to get 120 people crammed up there maybe playing the racetrack. Huh? Maybe there had been uh, an unfortunate death. Maybe or, Johnny Boy was up there, Ed, huh? Yeah, maybe a barmaid had a bad experience up there, huh? Well, you know, it's funny. Ghosts are like philosophers. They turn up in strange places. And I, I <laughs> certainly didn't, didn't think that I was going to have a ghost when I opened up this pub. Are you uh, safe enough there that you're going to stay there? I mean, uh... yeah, I've kind of grown accustomed to it. I was telling Richard, you know, it's like a cat or whatever. You know, it, it becomes a part of the pub. 
And she lets us know, every time I think she's gone, she lets us know she's still there. She storms across the floor. And it, that, the foot stomping goes from about October up through April. Have you ever thought about calling an exorcist? I, I called in a spiritualist one time. I thought I exercised the place, and I, um, I thought it had worked. For about a month, nothing happened. No. Then the footsteps came back. Well, uh, let me ask, Richard, I mean, uh, if a place is exorcised, is that any guarantee that you've chased the spirits well, away? the traditional religious exorcism, I'm afraid, Eddie, is for evil spirits, and that's not a ghost. I mean, a ghost is something no. totally different. So that's why, uh, for the most part, um, trying to exorcise a ghost is a futile attempt to uh, uh, solve something that can't be solved that way. You usually have to just let ghosts run their course and burn out of their own uh, uh, energy on their own. Yeah. It's like one of my favorite writers, P.J. O'Rourke, says, it's like trying to cure evil with room deodorant. Yeah. Yeah. What a story. What a story. The Red Lion, huh? I'll have to check that out sometime. Although I don't know if I want to go upstairs. Well, well you don't have to. Wait downstairs be... and you can hear the ghost yeah, above exactly. your head, right? <laughs> it's the best way to take it in. Why is it that ghosts are so often connected with taverns? Uh, there's many uh, a restaurant, many a tavern, but you've got to realize all the uh, life that went on, all the activity that went on, and constant flow of people. And whenever you've got that kind of uh, uh, swinging of humanity back and forth through your doors, well, you've got a lot of potential. Here's a question that might be relevant to this. Chris, are you there? Hey, Chris, uh, Eddie? Yeah, go ahead, Chris, yeah, with I, your question. Uh, Richard, I talked to you, I think, a couple years ago. Uh, we had our house uh, here uh -huh. in Denver when it was... Uh, uh, we think it was on it some time ago. We never believed in that stuff before. And footsteps in the attic, uh, gates opening, closing by themselves, um, cold spot ice detected in the kitchen. Uh, my mother heard voices whispering from the closet. She could speak out distinct words occasionally, a heavy sigh behind her. Finally, the, the dog would never go into the bedroom. It was refused to sleep there where it always used to sleep before uh, when we, in the old house. And then finally she had shot it up in the attic. And that evening the dog walked into the bedroom by itself and... Uh, Everything had been cleared up. I think I mentioned that story a couple of years ago, and you know, as a, just relating it to you. Uh -huh. Now, nothing has happened since then, but just recently, uh, and it seems like it's a different type of a attitude. Um, a, an exhaust fan over the stove. It's not operated by a thermostat. It's just a regular on-off switch with a with a, a speed control on there. Came on for about ten minutes and came off. And we wrote that off as a, well. That's a nothing. And within a day or two later. And it went off, but like I say, about 10 minutes later, by of its own accord. There's no short circuit. Uh, we know about electricians, electricity and stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, the other, about two days later, my father woke up and thought something was wrong with the furnace, and he looked at the thermostat, and something had pushed the thermostat control all the way down to the